Okay, so let's take a look at getting Mentory up and running. The first thing you got to do is get the plugin loaded. Um, so I'm going to go into Windows, Settings and Preferences, Plugin Manager. And inside the Plugin Manager, what I'm looking for is Maya 2 MR. And I can see that they're both loaded. Once you load those, that's going to give you uh, this, the menus that will appear within the shaders and the lights, the render global dialog, um, Mental Ray's custom uh, render stuff, which is over here in, uh, sorry, let me open this over here, Windows, Render Editors, Mental Ray, and you've got some of the different things in here that you can adjust for Mental Ray also, which we'll talk about. Um, so out in the general interface, the way that you'll show uh, the mental ray stuff is, for example, I can grab onto my camera underneath the camera attribute editor and take a look at some of the settings that it's got going on in here. Everything will have all objects, shaders, lights, cameras in this case, will have a mental ray tab. And inside of it might be, for example, an output shader or a volume shader, lens shader, whatever, um, whatever specific to that object within uh, mental ray. So, um, for example, if I go into the hyper shade and I look at uh, shader. This is just a default Lambert and if I go under mental ray um, you can see some of the options that are available. There's a refraction blur, reflection blur, there's incandescence or irradiance and irradiance color. Um, there's some photon attributes. All of these things we'll cover later but the idea is that mental ray has been very tightly integrated within the interface itself so there's many different levels that the object can be objects can be adjusted. Um, also if I had for example a sphere um, out in the uh, translation node of the object, you've got just some bare bones settings. Uh, where is it going to be deriving some of its default render stuff from in terms of global illumination, for example? Where is it going to pull that kind of thing out? And then uh, on the shape node of the object, you also have a mental ray tab and you have the ability to custom adjust some of these different attributes, which we'll talk about um, later. So there's a lot of different ways that you can get into mental ray. Uh, one of the key ways probably is going to be the render globals. So I'm just going to open that up. And uh, throughout the demo, I'll probably be using a lot of um, hotkeys and also a menu, which I'll show you how to make. It's very straight ahead. Um, for the render globals, I'm going to go to Windows, Render Editors, Render Globals. And from now on, I'm just going to use a hotkey to open that up. So inside the render globals, you've got two different uh, sets of tabs that you can adjust. Um, in this version of Maya, you've got your unified render global settings. So I can either adjust things via the common attributes or I can get into it via the mentor ray attributes. Um, inside of the common attributes, I can adjust things that are common to all the different Maya uh, renderers, so forth, like uh, the, whatever the name is going to be. Um, if I'm going to have a, f a naming convention, in this case, I have it set to name dot number dot extension. Um, if I'm going to have frame padding, if I'm going to render out to a specific format, which these are the same formats you'll normally have inside of Maya with some additions, you can render out custom mental ray data. Um, maybe I'll leave it on Maya IFF for now. I have the render regular animation stuff, start frame, end frame, um, renderable objects. Sometimes it can help in your rendering to. Uh, only render a selected object. You'll have a complicated scene and you'll select one of the objects and tell it to only render active and it'll sort of speed that up without having to hide everything else in the scene. Um, I'm going to set it back to render all. The next thing is camera. I'm going to set this to render the perspective camera and in a second I want to show you uh, how to make sure you're not rendering the other cameras that you don't mean to. Um, custom file name extension if you have a custom extension that you're using or a custom file format which we're not. Um, render uh, renumber for frames, which we're not going to renumber any frames. Uh, resolution, you have your settings that normally come with Ma with Maya up here, and down here. Let me resize this window. In the lower set of these listings, you'll see that I've created some uh, custom resolutions, which I want to show you how to create. And the reason that I want to take a moment to look at this is because inside of Maya, for example, if I was over in Maya Software Render and we were adjusting some of these resolutions, I could say, I want this to be 720 by 400. And I would have the ability to maintain a square pixel aspect ratio, which is what you would use for film. Or I can adjust the device aspect ratio and thereby changing the pixel aspect ratio. So maybe I want the device aspect to be 1.5 and it'll force the pixel aspect to compensate. Um, generally what people are most familiar with is the pixel aspect ratio. You're either working on a film which is one per, uh, square pixels or you might be working on television which is 0.9% uh, aspect ratio. Um, 
most of the time you don't really know what the device aspect ratio is. So I find it very useful to set up my custom render or my, my custom uh, resolutions. And that way I can just adjust these things as I need. I can set up a default and automatically it'll snap me into these resolutions as well as whatever the device is supposed to be. So I'll go back into Mentoray. And in order to do that, you just need a custom user script. It's very simple to set up. So I'm gonna step out to the interface or the uh, desktop and show you that. I'm gonna open up uh, my documents and I'm gonna go into Maya and scripts. And inside of scripts, you'll see I have a file called user image formats. And I'm just gonna right mouse click and tell it to open with, uh, let's see here, choose program. I want it to open with just a word, word pad. That sounds fine. I'll tell it to open. And inside of here, you can see some of the custom uh, render resolutions that I've created. So I've got my super 35 half at 1024 by 778 at 1.316 as a device aspect. So the only thing that's real important here is that you just keep this syntax correct. Um, if you get one of these wrong, for example, you forget to put a comma in, all that will happen is inside of Maya, nothing will show up in the render globals um, under resolutions. And then you know you've just made a mistake out here and you can come out and adjust. But that's pretty much all there is to it. You just follow this syntax and uh, you'll have your custom resolutions. So I'm gonna go ahead and close that up and get us back into Maya. So back into the render globals. Once we have our custom resolution set up, so I'm gonna set us to Super 35 TV. Um, everything else can sort of remain the same. The only thing you might wanna turn off is your enable default light. And the reason that you might wanna do that is that later on we'll be doing final gather renders. And uh, for a final gather render, maybe we'll be using a object that is acting as the light source. For example, a, a sphere that has incandescence mapped. And in that case, I don't have a light in the scene and I, and I don't want it to create a default light. So if I turn this off, we won't get a default light being created. Basically, the default light's going to be created if you don't have a light in the scene. It's trying to compensate and help you with your render. So I'm gonna turn that off. Now, if we step over into the mental ray tab, um, there's a whole bunch of different settings in here that we can take a look at. Anti-aliasing is how you're gonna control the overall image quality. So once you've decided what you're rendering, uh, whether it's ray trace or scan line, if you're doing ray trace shadows, depth map shadows, if you have motion blur, whatever, the resulting image that is generated has to be processed to a certain level and all of those things are gonna be figured out within the anti-aliasing. Uh, ray tracing is the same thing that you have within Maya. You have the number of reflections and refractions and then you have your max trace depth and shadow trace depth. For example, if you have a wine glass that has six different sides that uh, a ray can pass through, then you would have to set this up to a six, which we'll get to when we start talking about those things. Um, scan line, whether you want it to be set to off so it doesn't scan line render and it only uses the ray trace renderer, um, whether you have it set to on and it uses the scan line renderer, whether you have it set to OpenGL. And there are certain operations that Mentoray will shovel onto a graphics card, for example, an NVIDIA graphics card that has the correct um, hardware settings. You can use that to help in your render and it can dramatically increase the uh, speed of the render. The downside of that is that sometimes the quality is, is sort of compromised, but things like depth map shadows, for example, can benefit from an OpenGL card um, that's properly equipped. So you could use OpenGL if you like. And then there's a new mode, um, well, it's not a new mode, but it was just recently revealed inside of 6.0 um, called Rapid, which is a way of using uh, Mentoray to hold samples to help speed up what's happening with, with motion blur. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So I'm just gonna set this to on. And uh, faces is sort of similar to what Maya is. You can render the front face or the back face or both. Um, currently, there's really not a flag inside of Maya to tell Mentoray which side to render. You'll Remember that inside of uh, Maya's renderer, for example, if we were to grab onto an object, I could open up my attribute spreadsheet and take a look at what was going to be rendering. And maybe I have it set to double side render, which means the inside and the outside is gonna render. Maybe I wanna turn it to opposite so that the inside and the outside is swapped. Um, and if I was to say, don't render double sided, then it would not render the inside. And if I had, for example, for some reason, the surface was rendering inside out or backwards, I could just tell it to flip to opposite. Well, Mental Ray isn't gonna really pay attention to those flags. So when you tell it to render either front face or back face, you're literally saying for the entire scene, render the front faces or the back faces. So you have to go through your scene and make sure that everything is facing the right direction. Um, if you wanted to render both faces, you can just say both faces. 
shadows, you have the ability to cast you have the ability to cast ray trace shadows and um, depth map shadows. And there's a couple of different shadow methods, uh, which will be discussed later. Motion blur. Motion blur is very comprehensive inside of Mentor Ring. You have an awful lot of control with it. And uh, there's different ways you can blur things, either on an object basis or a component basis. And uh, we'll talk about that. Caustics and global illumination. Um, it's the process of tracing a, a, a light photon through the scene. And uh, that'll be covered in disc three. Final gather, it's the process of sampling ambient light, essentially, within the scene. And that'll be covered later. Diagnostics, we're gonna, uh, it's going to help us sort of pick apart um, the rendering as we go through and figure out where we have problem areas or just sort of visualize what the renderer is building. And we'll talk about that. Features, this is just uh, what Mentor Ray is going to be outputting, which we'll take a look at what happens when we hit the render button inside of Mentor Ray in a second. Overrides, if you have surface approximations or tessellations that you want to override throughout the entire scene, this will do that, which again we'll talk about. Contours, uh, Mentor Ray has a special um, set of render tools that allow you to generate contours, which is the edges of either an object or the edges of a face or the edges of materials and sort of give you um, what's traditionally called a tune renderer and uh, we'll cover that as well. Image-based lighting, that's a new feature inside of 6.0. It allows you to use an image to cast off final gather rays or global illumination rays or just to act as a reflection map within the scene. Frame buffer attributes, uh, we'll talk about this here in just a second. This is talking about the kind of information that's going to be generated within Mental Ray and then how you're going to combine all that stuff together. Uh, memory and performance is very, very important. We'll talk about this in depth. You have two different operations you can sort of use here. BSP, which stands for binary space partition, or grid, and they're just different ways of structuring the memory. And you also have a large BSP, which is basically multiple BSP trees. Um, translation, this is the information that is output when you're uh, creating a render. It gives you an output through your... Um, through your uh, output window and it allows you to track whether it's tessellating, whether it's loading an image um, or the process of the renderer and you can tell it exactly what information it exports and uh, what kind of progress message you would like. Uh, preview, whether you're going to preview the animation, it'll actually render out the animation in the viewport or you want to preview motion blur or you want to preview render tiles as things are being um, rendered or if you have custom shaders in the scene, if you want to preview custom shaders or custom text. Um, custom entries, again, we'll talk about this in just a second. Um, whether you have a lot of these different settings for specific shaders. And then render layers, pass control. This is the ability to have Mantle Ray break your render up into multiple passes. Um, for example, I could say I want you to enable render layers, which means that out here under display, I have also render layers, and I can assign objects to different render layers, and it'll create a different a layered image that we can then composite together. And if I tell it that I want to enable render layer passes, that means that I can break up the shading information on the surface into different segments or groups. For example, um, a beauty pass is going to combine um, both color and shadow, but if I turn beauty off and I want it to generate color, then I can have color and shadow. Or if I want to break the color ch pass up into multiple levels, I can have a diffuse pass which shows no reflected specular, or I can have specular. And by that, by segmenting things out in such a way, you have a lot more control inside of your render. Um, so Mental Ray definitely supports this. The only addendum here is that if you tell it to output the subdirectories, you need to have subdirectories built that match the names and the, the naming scheme within the scene, otherwise it doesn't know where to output things. So let's talk about creating your default set of render globals. I find that really, really useful because there's some settings that I go through every time I use Mentor Ray and adjust. And uh, if you create a set of defaults, then you don't have to sit there and do this every single time. So underneath preference or uh, presets, you can see under load presets, I have my 2K uh, initial settings and my production TV settings. For example, if I wanted to make a, a, a new initial settings, um, I'm going to show you what I normally set this up as. So um, first thing is a naming convention. I'm going to set it up to name.number.extension. The next thing is whatever the file format is going to be rendering out to. Um, and 
probably what you should do is just render everything out to Maya IFF unless you have a specific need to use one of these other formats because what Mental Ray and Maya are going to do is generate an IFF format or file and then it's going to convert it into one of those different formats. So initially starting out with an IFF is a good idea. Um, your starts frame and your end frame, if it's something you're going to be rendering through batch mode, you can set it up there if you're rendering through command line. Um, you can differentiate your start and end frames later on if you want to. By frame, it's just telling it that you want it to render every frame as opposed to every other frame. And frame padding, I usually set to four because it just makes it easier to follow the numbering convention. If I set it to three, you can see that we only have three zeros. If I set it to four, you can see that we have four zeros. Um, the next setup in here is renderable objects. I do have it set to render all. Um, I have my camera set to, for example, right now, perspective. But let's say that I made a new camera. If I go to create cameras, maybe I'll make a, a two-node camera, a camera with a name. And there's my two-node camera. Okay. Um, I want to make sure that I only render this two-node camera. So I have a little script up here on a shelf that says render globals. And if I open this up, I have the ability to turn on and off these different cameras. And I really recommend that you use a script like this because it makes it a lot easier to see, number one, what cameras you have in the scene, and number two, what you're set up to render with. And all that script is, if I just go into my shelf editor, I can go down here and grab onto that script. And let's see here. I think that one is it right there. Select defaults for render globals. If I go to edit commands, you can just see it says select default render globals, open AE window. And with that created and assigned to a button, when I function this button, it pulls up this window and I can tell uh, Mental Ray which camera to render. So that's useful because a lot of times when you kick off a render, you'll end up rendering multiple images and that can be really annoying, let alone very expensive. So right now we're only set up to render with camera one. Um, back to my render globals. Once I've selected my camera, that's good to go. Um, if I want to output a Z-depth channel, I can set that up here as well. And the next thing I'll talk about inside of the other set of render globals is what the frame buffer stuff is. So I'm going to leave that for now. But the RGB and the alpha are going to be handled within Mental Ray's frame buffer. So I'm going to leave depth channel to turn on maybe or off, doesn't matter. Um, and then whatever the resolutions are going to be. For my initial settings, I want to set them to 720 by 547. And 547 is just exactly half of, of or an exact derivative of 2048 by 1556. If I set this to 720, I get 547. And so I can interchange this with a film plate by multiplying this by whatever that number is and all of my proportions line up. So I usually leave this set to 720 by 547. Um, next thing I'll usually do is just turn off the default light because I don't want it to show up in a render that I'm not intending it to be. I'm gonna step over to Mental Ray. Um, inside of Mental Ray, underneath anti-aliasing quality, Initially, I'm going to leave this stuff set as it is. And again, I'm showing you what the default setup is. I'm going to go through each one of these things and tell you exactly how to adjust it. Um, for right now, we're just setting up our defaults. So my number of samples, negative 2 and 0 is fine. Filter type box, that's fine. The contrast threshold of 0 to 1 um, is fine. I'm going to turn off the sample options. Underneath ray trace, this is kind of a bugger. Sometimes when you render things out with a reflection or a refraction, you'll be expecting to get some nice, beautiful bending reflection and all you'll get is black. And a lot of times that has to do with the fact that you don't have enough reflection or refraction rays being passed through the scene. So I make the choice to set this up to six by six. And what that'll allow you to do is if you had a water glass in the scene or a cognac glass or something, and you were to render reflections, you would get pass through reflections and refractions on all the different sides of the glass. Also, it's a fairly expensive render because you're allowing the, the rays that are being created to pass through six different layers. So it's a little bit expensive, but I'm doing it um, knowingly. So every time that I set this up and use my initial settings, I'm going to six by six. If the render seems to be really, really slowing down on the uh, ray trace operations, um, I can go in here and turn it down. But initially, that's why I set this up. Scan line, I'm going to initially turn this to off. And the reason that I do that is that Mental Ray in previous versions had a problem with crashing a lot. 
And the, the first thing that they would tell you is to turn off Scanline and then underneath memory and performance to set the ta or, uh, memory limits to set it to 800. And we'll talk about how to drive these numbers exactly here in a few minutes. Um, but initially, I've just set Scanline to off and I've set my uh, memory limit to 800. Okay, and faces, I'm gonna leave it to both because I don't know if I've gone through and actually adjusted the facing ratios on the surfaces yet. Um, shadows, this is very important. You have shadow methods that are set to uh, segments initially, and what you probably wanna set this to is simple as a default, and the reason is um, these shadow methods pertain to uh, ray trace shadows, and you've got four different options here, one of them being off. Simple is just a regular old ray trace shadow. Sort is when a shadow is calculated even for objects that are being occluded. Uh, usually if you have two objects in a scene and one object is bigger in front of the other object and light rays aren't able to see it, um, for example, if we had a couple of spheres and this guy was a little bit bigger and I had a light over here that was casting through and this is an opaque surface, when it casts through here and stops and generates a shadow, it doesn't calculate the shadow in back of itself or for this object. And the reason is that it's occluded. So there's really no reason in calculating the shadow for this guy. If you turn on sort, it will calculate that shadow. And so it can be a little more expensive to do. And the reason that you'd want to do that is for some sort of a custom shader. And then segments are allowing the shadows to calculate through a volume, which we'll talk about later. Um, for example, if you had uh, cloud type particles or if you had a... Uh, um, fur or if you had fluids or anything that would require a shadow to be traced through a volume you'd need to have segments turned on in order to get that to work since I'm not initially doing any of these things I'm just gonna turn this to simple shadow maps this is if you're gonna be using a depth map shadow and uh, I'm just gonna turn this to on for right now again OpenGL can be used if you want to use the benefits of a graphics card which I don't want to do that right now I don't want to introduce um, artifacting into the renderer unless I absolutely need to so and sometimes you will get artifacting with OpenGL stuff because it's using a hardware render language to describe it so I'm just gonna turn off I'm just gonna go shadow maps to on um, rebuild shadow maps you have the ability to cache the shadow maps to disk uh, just like you do inside of Maya which is a function on the light itself which we'll look at um, and sometimes when you're shading you want to force the scene to globally rebuild all those shadow maps which you can turn on here um, another wonderful feature of Mental Ray is that if you have motion blur within the scene, I can tell it to generate motion blurred shadow maps. Um, let's see here, if I turn on motion blur, generate motion blurred shadow maps, and then the, motion, the shadow maps will motion blur, which is uh, pretty nice. Um, the next setup is motion blur, and I'm not going to have any motion blur initially calculated within the scene, so I can leave that off. Again, caustics and globe illumination, I'm not going to calculate that stuff initially, so it's off. Same thing with final gather. Diagnostic, I'm not trying to diagnose my scene straight off the bat, so I'm going to leave that stuff turned off. Um, features, again, I'm outputting all the standard stuff, so I'm going to leave everything there alone. Overrides, in terms of tessellation and caustics or global illumination, um, I'm not doing any of that stuff right now, so I don't want to introduce any custom overrides into the scene, so I'm just going to turn those things as they are. Uh, contours, that's the uh, tune shader essentially. I'm not doing any of that, so I can leave that alone. We're not doing any image-based lighting, so I'll leave that alone. Uh, frame buffer attributes. Now this is something that you want to consider. Um, initially you have data type, you have the gamma, you have the color clip, and you have all these different interpolation settings. Um, the first thing you need to decide is what kind of information are you going to be generating. Initially, if we're generating RGBA, we're generating four channels at eight bits per channel, which is pretty much standard. And that's why out here we don't have the ability to say I want to generate color or RGB or I'm sorry alpha or RGB is because it's being figured out inside of the frame buffer. So right now we're generating RGB plus alpha which for, again four bits plus eight. Um, if I only wanted to generate RGB I could say three bits or three channels at eight bit or if I wanted to generate RGB at 16 bits per channel or 32 bits per channel and the same thing for um, RGB plus alpha. You also have the ability to just output an alpha, um, to output an alpha with floating points. Um, sometimes there's information that can be clipped in an 8-bit alpha that you want to generate. Um, if you want to output depth, and again, this is a this is a, a, a custom uh, depth format. If you were to generate data type depth, you would have to come back out into um, your regular render settings, and inside of Maya, you would need to generate a mental ray depth um, file, which we're not going to do right now. I'm just going to allow this to use Maya's own Z-Depth channel if I want to do that. But you have the ability to output it 
um, you have RGBE, which is a floating point um, image. It's sort of the same thing as a high dynamic range image. You can sit there and adjust the exposures. So basically you can just see you have a lot of different options in here of what you output. I'm gonna set this to um, RGB plus alpha, four bits at, or four channels at eight bits per channel. That should be fine. The gamma is going to be fine. Um, the color clip mode, this is sort of important if you start getting uh, compositing weirdness. Basically what happens is when you generate an image, the uh, in an eight bit image, you have zero to 255 for the um, number of colors that are presented for each channel. And if you tell it to generate raw or allow the information to just remain raw, you can have information that exists outside of those bounds. And so um, forcing it to conform to RGB or to conform to alpha is going to be a real important aspect of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to force the color clip to conform the alpha to the RGB. And so I'm going to set this to just RGB. And the rest of the stuff will be fine. Memory and performance. Uh, we're going to get into an in-depth discussion on what BSP is going to be. But initially, I'm going to change these settings to 15 and 35. Um, I just find those to be optimum initial settings, so I'm going to leave that there. Uh, memory limits, we talked about setting this to 800 megabytes, um, which the way that you should ideally derive what this physical memory attribute should be set to is that you should set it to half of whatever the physical RAM in the machine is. So if you're working on a system that has 2 gigs of RAM, for example, you should set that to 1 gigabyte um, or 1,000 K or 1,000 megabytes. Um, you don't want to, initially this could be set to zero. The only problem with doing that is that you will function um, operations within Mentoray that'll use up every possible amount of RAM before it starts disk swapping, uh, for example, using a uh, displacement map. And you don't really want to uh, force the system to run out of memory because it'll start crashing. So if you set this number to half of what uh, the system has, you should be pretty safe. So I'm gonna set this to 800. Translation, this is real important for helping you diagnose uh, what's happening within your render as um, it progresses. You basically get your output window and it'll give you a feedback message saying, um, right now I'm translating a file, right now I'm tessellating a surface, right now I'm generating displacement or I'm casting global illumination. And you probably want to be able to follow that progress um, to, if you have a problem, you can diagnose it right there. Or if it's getting hung up on a heavy image, for example, you'll see it. So I'm going to set this guy to progress messages, and it'll basically kick out any error messages that it gets, as well as keep me apprised of the progress that it's making, and the rest of this stuff will be fine. Um, the only other thing that you're going to want to set up in here is custom entries. I want to set pass surface color to alpha channel to on, and a combination of setting pass uh, surface color to alpha channel, as well as inside of the frame buffer telling it to force color clip to RGB. Um, sometimes when you do a render, you'll get alpha channels that don't necessarily make sense with the color channel. For example, the alpha channel will um, simply not hold information for a transparent object. And the way to get around that, or the way to force Mentor Ray into showing you the correct kind of information is to tell it to pass the surface color to the alpha channel and also to color clip to RGB. And then most of the time your alpha channels are, should line up to your color information. And the rest of this stuff, I don't really have any custom uh, entries inside of scenes and so forth, so I can leave all that off. And then my render pass layer control, I'm just gonna leave these things to off because I don't wanna generate initial uh, render passes. So those are my settings. And uh, once we have those set up, I'm gonna go to presets save presets as a presetting. I can save new initial settings and save presets. And now whenever I open up a scene, I can say load presets, initial settings or new initial settings, whichever, and it'll automatically um, load all that stuff up into my window and I won't have to go back into it and adjust those things.